So welcome to our participants already. We're going to start in two minutes from now. I hope you make yourself comfortable. Maybe have a coffee or tea or some water in front of you, um, depending on the timing. Yesterday, we had people who joined us in the middle of the night. So of course, my coffee recommendation was probably not the wisest one. And you can see the house rules. Okay, I think it's 4.30 Manila time. We're gonna start any moment. Okay, so welcome to our innovation marketplace on innovating higher education for sustainable food production. This session will provide a brief overview of key elements in the Dutch approach of NUFIC to higher education agriculture. And so we will hear from two experts today and I'm very pleased to have with us um, maybe ladies first, Anastasia Rossier, the country manager of NUFIC NISO Indonesia. And in this role, she is responsible for the management and monitoring of the Orange Knowledge Program in Indonesia, which offers access to education and training for professionals and organizations. She brings seven years of experience in the public and non-private sector and has worked extensively with students and knowledge institutions, focusing on scholarship management and experiential learning. So welcome, Anastasia. And with us is also Peter van Tuchel, the director of the Nufik Niso Indonesia. Um, he's originally from the Netherlands, but based in Jakarta. He oversees the work of Nufik in Southeast Asia, including the office in Vietnam and is also the NUFIX program director for the European Union support to higher education in the ASEAN region project. And Peter has worked for different organizations and projects in Indonesia and was also the executive, executive director of the Global Partnership for the Prevention of Armed Conflict. And he has also published a lot. So we have two senior experts on the topic. They are going to present to you maybe something around 20 minutes. And before I hand over to them and maybe they say a little bit more about themselves and their organization as well, I want to encourage all of you to make heavy use of the chat. As So if you have any comments or questions, please put them in the chat. However, looking, let's see where we are by approximately 25 after the, uh, or close to 5 p.m. Manila time, if we are not a large, much larger group, we might even encourage you to ask your questions and short comments uh, live and we allow you to uh, switch on the camera. But let's see how we are going, if still many people joining. So I think we are good for now. And I hand over to Peter and Anastasia. Okay. Thank you very much, Joost, for the introduction. Thank you very much, uh, Asian Development Bank, for inviting us uh, to do this presentation this afternoon, Manila time. Uh, myself, I'm actually in the Netherlands, in The Hague at the moment on a rainy day, uh, but very happy to be with you this afternoon. Um, I'm Peter van Taal. I represent uh, Nuffig Neso, the Netherlands Education Support Office um, in Indonesia, but our office has uh, a function across Southeast Asia. Um, we connect the Dutch knowledge sector to the knowledge sector in Indonesia and Southeast Asia. We work closely with the business sector. And uh, you will see that uh, return in our presentation. Um, 
please let's move to the next uh, slide. So we're gonna talk about higher education in agriculture and um, uh, the Netherlands role, the Netherlands knowledge sector role in that. So let's start a little bit with context for this discussion. Why the Netherlands? Uh, perhaps I'm saying a few things that are known to the audience. Um, the Netherlands is the second largest agri-exporter in the world. Um, in 2020, the Dutch agri-export amounted to uh, a little bit over a hundred billion euros. Uh, so there is traditionally a very significant Dutch business involvement in agriculture. And I'd like to stress uh, the Netherlands is known for its flowers. That is, uh, makes a, a visit to our country worthwhile. But it's not just flowers, it is across uh, the different uh, components of the agri sector, agri sector that you will find the Dutch involvement. So in poultry, chicken, in dairy, milk, cows, uh, horticulture is very important nowadays, um, etc. cetera. Um, what this implies also is that the Netherlands is a large uh, in agriculture investor in Asia. Um, Asia is a region uh, where we believe there's a lot of needs and opportunities for agricultural development. Uh, I think, uh, of course, an overarching aspect in this skills forum is what is the impact of COVID-19? What we see uh, all over the world, but certainly also in Asia, is that it again has emphasized for people, for governments, the importance of a healthy population that can withstand literally a pandemic, the importance of good and healthy food that is produced in sustainable ways. So I think COVID-19 uh, is, is providing rather an additional incentive uh, in the region and also for the Netherlands to be even more active in this field. Um, then uh, the Dutch business involvement is based on an extensive involvement of the Dutch knowledge sector in researching, uh, in scientific research in agriculture. I think most of you probably know Wageningen University as a top-notch center uh, in, this, uh, in this field. But I'd like to stress that it is not just Wageningen. Uh, there is a whole layer of universities of applied sciences, Hanse, Aare, Saxion, uh, where we also receive many students from Asia um, that focus on more applied research. And that goes down in the education column to vocational training, where again, the schools are really important. And we work at all of those levels also in Asia. As I said, the emphasis, of course, is nowadays on how can we improve food production? How can we improve the quality of food? How we can we improve the production process so that it uh, contributes to more of a circular economy with minimal waste, with less energy use, um, so that food production contributes to achieving the sustainable development goals. So it's important, and you will see that reflected in our presentation, we do not look upon higher education in agriculture as a single domain, as one box. Uh, we try to look at that in an integrated way uh, to try and promote sustainable food production and to build an education sector around it, uh, it requires interdisciplinary uh, research. It's not only on figuring out what is the best seed for rice, for example, but it is also about clean water. It is about efficient energy use. We look at the whole production chain uh, and we try to involve uh, different stakeholders uh, and bring them closely together, government, business, the education sector itself, of course, um, and co local communities often, so that we, we have a process of co-creation of education, if you wish. Next slide, please. 
Um, just briefly on NUFIC. Uh, so the role of my own organization is uh, to be the facilitator, especially uh, of the relationships between the different knowledge sectors in the Netherlands and in Asia. Um, and uh, we do that uh, in a variety of ways. The Orange Knowledge Program is one of the most important. That's a large worldwide program also rolled out in Asia where we facilitate uh, institutional collaboration, tailor-made trainings, short courses, scholarships. Uh, we have hundreds of projects and about half of this program is focused on uh, food and nutrition security. Uh, which speaks to uh, the context that I was just trying to describe. Uh, lots of collaboration between knowledge institutions. And um, here, uh, something to which we will return also in this presentation. Um, there are, of course, many people from Asia that have studied in the Netherlands, and this will perhaps not surprise you, many of them have studied in the agricultural sector. Uh, in Wageningen or in one of these universities of applied sciences or related studies, um, we try to make actively use of our large alumni networks in Asia in the agricultural sector uh, as um, uh, ambassadors, as, uh, because they know the Netherlands, they know their own context, to make the connection, to make the match, so to say. So that is uh, the role of our organization. Next slide, please. Um, then let's talk a little bit about, you know, the title of this, this session, um, Netherlands Agriculture, Innovating Higher Education. How do we look at that? Um, throughout the skills forum, of course, you have seen presentations that focus more on the technical modalities of education. And there is digitalization of education, digitalization of credit transfer, microcredits, and so forth. Those things are all happening also in higher education, in agriculture. But uh, we thought it is more interesting for you not to focus our presentation so much on those elements because they happen across the whole education sector. Um, what we focus on is as I said, building these links between the different uh, stakeholders, business, education sector, government, so to create more of a demand-driven higher education that works closer to the labor market also, uh, because uh, agriculture is an important provider of employment, which is also very important throughout uh, Asia. Um, and uh, the, the short uh, descriptions of cases that we are presenting uh, look at innovations uh, in the interfaces between these different uh, uh, actors, the different stakeholders, because governments do not always easily work with the private sector or education institutions need to be closer to the private sector. That needs work to make the connections so that um, sustainable food production can be based on an integrated approach involving everybody. Uh, so we will look at uh, the living lab idea, which is uh, trying to establish a learning agenda based on business needs. Uh, we will look at institutional collaboration within the education column between different layers, uh, scientific research, applied research. And finally, we will look at a campaign to involve youth in agriculture in Asia, because that was actually coming out of an alumni conference that we had two years ago, uh, where many of our alumni in the agriculture sector observed that look, we, have, we share a problem throughout Asia, and that is that agriculture is not very popular. Uh, so we try to work on that as well, and CC will explain more about that uh, later. Next slide, please. So let us talk a little bit through the living lab concept. Uh, the idea there is that you bring um, the business sector that you, you have joined groups of students. In this case, uh, uh, I'm exemplifying this by uh, uh, talking you through a case that we uh, work on at the moment 
uh, to promote sustainable tourism uh, around Lake Toba. Uh, Lake Toba is the largest sweetwater lake in Indonesia. And the Indonesian government, here comes the interest of one of the key stakeholders, has decided to make that a priority destination for tourism development. We then immediately add, well, let's make that sustainable tourism development that does not burden too much um, on the local environment, um, rather strengthens it. Um, and uh, we engaged with local universities, with the Dutch uh, Center of Expertise on Leisure, Tourism and Hospitality, uh, headed by the Breda University of Applied Sciences. So we composed groups of, in this case, Indonesian and Dutch students to work on sustainable tourism. The Living Lab idea is that the problems that they try to resolve are business problems, problems of the private sector. And uh, learning from experiences with some previous living labs, um, the, there you often see that the, the education goals are met, that the students and the universities are happy because students learn a lot, but that the business goals are not met, that uh, not so much the results of living labs leads, supports actual investment. So in the case of our living lab uh, in uh, North Sumatra, we thought, well, let's try to turn the process around and uh, uh, start with putting out an expression of interest to the private sector. And we could do that because there was a Dutch business mission to North Sumatra and start with asking the private sector, what are the problems you would like students to work on? And we got quite a bit of response to that, different kind of ideas and projects. They have been selected now, um, and they are around clean water, they are around fisheries also in the lake, because of the, the current practice of fishing is very polluting in Lake Toba, um, and um, uh, around creating a sustainable food production, uh, which is supportive of the higher end of the tourism market because uh, your, your European or American tourists and increasingly also your Asian tourists coming to Lake Toba want to eat responsibly produced food. Um, so how can we help the local communities in, in doing it? And how can we build an education sector that support those developments? So we're excited about this. Uh, the students will start to work on their selected cases in September. And we're keen to learn more how uh, in the coming years, hopefully due to very close links with the business sectors that will accompany the students partly also, how we can actually let students learn, but do that in a way that will facilitate actual investment in sustainable tourism around Lake Toba. Then I turn over to Anastasia for the next part of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. So I want to continue um, what Peter has explained about the Living Labs earlier, where we will engage our ML alumni uh, to increase awareness, strengthen the network, and support professional development. We currently have over 9,300 active alumni in the region. Um, as Peter has mentioned before, that our alumni are equipped with knowledge about the Netherlands as well as their respective countries. Uh, they are well connected uh, with relevant connection to government, uh, private sector, and knowledge institutions, among others. So in the implementation of our projects, uh, it's very important for us to engage and mobilize our alumni network and link them in a positive way to make efforts to find solutions uh, to the shared problems within the region. Uh, next, I would like to talk about a project that's currently being implemented in Vietnam. Uh, this project is funded by the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, through the Orange Knowledge Program implemented by Saxion University of Applied Sciences and the National Economics University in Vietnam. So the aim of the project is to modernize and internationalize the climate change and water food economic course in the country. 
Uh, the project rationale is to transfer educational experiences and successfully implemented innovations in the Netherlands to Vietnam. Um, this project builds upon the knowledge and skills already gained by uh, the National Economics University and being updated and more practically adapted uh, by the experience of the applied research approach of the Saxion University. And this project connects uh, researchers um, and experts from the Netherlands and Vietnam. Uh, the impact of this particular project can be seen in different layers. For instance, on the faculty and university level is to shift theory-based education to education that combines theory and practical applications, for instance, through internships and case studies. This way, the graduates are expected to have not only a strong academic background, uh, but also meet the needs of the labor market in terms of knowledge and skills. Moving on, I want to talk about this um, exciting uh, campaign that we uh, recently launched. It's called the Empower Youth for Food Campaign. The main objective of this campaign is to improve the reputation of agriculture education and employment among young people in Southeast Asia and Bangladesh. So as you know that young people do not automatically gravitate towards um, pursuing a career in agriculture sector because it's seen uh, as uh, an old fashioned sector with an attractive career paths. But through this campaign, we want to change that perspective. Our main message is that um, agriculture is a sector that offers a lot of opportunities in terms of career, and there are plenty of room to innovate. This is another example where we involve our NL alumni who work in the agriculture and food systems to be a role model for, for the youth in the region to show that there are so many different career options uh, that this sector offers. This campaign will run for about one year and consist of four building blocks. A couple of weeks ago, we organized a webinar called the Orange Talk, uh, which highlighted challenges and opportunities of youth-led innovation for sustainable agriculture and food systems. Uh, in this webinar, we also involve our alumni uh, who are young professionals from the region with diverse background to share their insight and experiences working in the sector. During this event, we also announced the winner of the Changemaker Challenge, uh, which you can see here is part of the building blocks. The Changemaker Challenge was also launched together with this campaign back in April, uh, where we invite students to submit proposals of their innovative ideas uh, to stimulate innovations for a sustainable agri-food value chain in the region. We received over 30 excellent proposals from all over Southeast Asia and Bangladesh. Uh, and eventually we selected three winners who received um, 5,000 euros each to turn their ideas uh, into a tangible project. And uh, in November 6, uh, we are planning to organize a virtual Southeast Asia career fair, which can hopefully accommodate companies seeking for new talents and young job seekers from all over the region. And to close this presentation, I would like to share the trailer of the Change Maker Challenge. That is it from us. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you very much, Anastasia, for the presentation and outlining the work you have done. So I think let's make it a very interactive and engaging session for the last approximately half hour. I saw already two um, 
two questions in the chat. I have to check quickly with my colleagues from the ADB. Can people uh, unmute themselves? Can we give them the rights and uh, and the webcam? Yes. Okay, so let's uh, go off script and maybe you all go on gallery view and um, and I uh, you can actually uh, put on your webcams if you're feeling comfortable. And I saw already first two question and if Eileen yeah. Vicios is actually okay with that, I'm gonna ask you and please don't, uh, people don't start a five minute monologue. You can quickly ask your question with a small intro, of course. And you can please then also introduce yourself shortly who you are so that Peter and Anastasia know who they are. So, so please, uh, um, Eileen, are you there? So if you are comfortable, you want to ask your question or you want me to post it to, to Peter and Anastasia? Okay, here she comes. Hello, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Um, hello. Hello. Hello, good afternoon, sir. Um, I just want to share with regards to um, my, uh, my reflection as new to, um, to our community. Um, one of our biggest problem here uh, uh, in the Philippines, here in our country, is that agriculture sectors are very less supported by other sectors where farmers and fisheries are unable to stand so, uh, to stand so they cannot provide to the community as food supplier. Um, that's why agriculture uh, courses are very less attractive to the young who are going to college. Uh, what is in their mind that farming are sent so poor in terms of livelihood and one of the other biggest reason is that Farming also requires a great capital to sustain its goal. So instead of being a job provider for some, um, uh, it becomes now a job seeker. Uh, my question is that you have any suggestions so that uh, we can improve our this kind of mindset or to the, especially the young and also to help our in, uh, institution to provide also encourage our uh, the young to, to, to do this kind of and job with regards to agricultural farming. Thank you, sir. Okay, thanks for the question. So, Anastasia, Peter, any, any thoughts on that? Is the question clear to you? Sure. Should I uh, start? And uh, Anastasia yeah. can follow on, of course. Yeah. Um, well, thanks, thanks for the question. Uh, and, you know, my, my quick response would be, join the campaign that uh, Anastasia was just outlining, because what you say fits exactly that the reason why we conduct the campaign, because you are so right, and this is not only in the Philippines, but all over Asia, young people look at the agriculture as old fashioned. It is not cool, so to say, to be a farmer. It is seen as something for old people. You don't make a lot of money. So the first thing to do is really build a communication strategy around it to change that reputation, to improve that reputation and to reach out to young people. And so, and say, you know, wait a minute, um, agriculture has everything to do with technology, for example. Um, if you look at the horticulture sector, how things are produced now, um, you know, that is not uh, just people going out uh, in, in, in the old fashioned way, but in high tech ways. Um, agriculture offers a good a job prospect. There are very solid possibilities to make some good money. Um, and you can also contribute to more cleaner production methodologies. I think the, for the young generation, who are uh, perhaps uh, you know, keenly aware about the impact of climate change and so on, uh, it can be motivating. Um, so that's what we try to achieve with the campaign. And then, of course, the campaign is a communication strategy, but then going more specifically to the education sector, uh, a whole number of projects that we do under the Orange Knowledge Program have to do with introducing these modern technologies into schools, uh, higher education institutions, but also uh, applied sciences and vocational training institutions. Um, 
you know, for example, uh, we just uh, had a sponsored import of a Bromax system. A Bromax is a, a, a way in which you uh, uh, basically lift the production of chicken from the floor completely up which makes it a lot cleaner and you don't have to give the chicken antibiotics anymore. You can take the dirt away. Um, and in other words, you, you in the schools, you show to the young generation that um, uh, agriculture is different now, is different from what they believe. Um, so that's where, you know, changing the reality of education plus a good communication strategy around it goes hand in hand in hopefully attracting, engaging the young generation to this important sector of the economy. Cici, maybe you want to yeah. add some uh, points. Yeah, sure. Um, thank you, Peter. I think Peter explained that um, very, very good, you know, in detail. Uh, what I want to add is that um, when you want to change uh, the, the mindset, if it really it's not just about the youth mindset, but also the parents, because as you know, parents have a lot of influence in their children and you know, parents uh, encourage them, their children to uh, seek for high paid jobs, um, the doctors, the lawyers, or working in business. Um, through our campaign, we actually, um, we, we uh, use, we use our, our NL alumni as a role model, our alumni who works in the sector uh, we involve them in the conversation, in the discussion, to show uh, the young people that um, there are there is more to the sector other than just farming. Farming is of course, of course important, but when you talk about food system, food chain, it's it's uh, it's a lot of opportunities there. There are so many different uh, things that you can do. And um, uh, another thing is that. Um, I think the, the school uh, also needs to, to support this campaign um, by showing that you can actually incorporate technology into farming or uh, into the agriculture uh, because youth, young people, they are uh, digital uh, literates and uh, they are very familiar with current technology. So anything that has technology in it, they will be pretty much interested. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think um, that would be my advice is that, uh, you know, you have to communicate this. Peter mentioned before that uh, a communication strategy is important, uh, not just for us nonprofit organization, but also, of course, for uh, the gra in the grassroots level of schools and, and the community as well. So. Mm -hmm. Anastasia, I think you're touching already the next question by uh, someone from the Mindhaven School. What uh, maybe I asked the person to to ask a question, but uh, I think it's very much what a uh, little bit related to what you just said. Does uh, the person from Mindhaven School quickly say who she is? I think it was a lady to and quickly ask the question. I think you are still on mute. I can see you, but you're still on mute. Okay, partly it has been answered, thank you. Uh, but uh, however, yes, I think we agree that there, there must be an intensified campaign because if the if you only expect that the college, to, I mean the high school graduate would take the course of agriculture right after high school, then there is no interest, there is no foundation on why should they value agriculture. If, if from preschool to elementary to high school, there was no exposure, but it's all about digital uh, things. So, of course, automatically, the, the course that they would take would be into that field, not agriculture. So I, and, also, and also the dichotomy of, of the digital not related to agriculture, it's something a far-fetched thing. So I think this time what you said that uh, how can the digital uh, techno or technology be related or can be useful to agriculture? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. Any any response from before we go for the next question? Well, it's it's in line, of course, with what we are saying. I I agree. You know, you, you, you it is important to start young. Uh, and uh, the key is to get uh, the right information uh, to uh, younger children at that level. Uh, and Anastasia, of course, correctly pointed out that the parents also play an important role in this. Um, 
And yeah, as much as we can, you know, we try to take younger people out for exposure tours. I mean, to show that agriculture is related to modern technology um, and I had to show another reality. Um, so it, that will require a major effort. Uh, so I, I agree with the speaker that, uh, you know, this is no small thing and it is important for countries in Asia to focus on the sector because food is the basis for everything. Yes, <laughs> yes. thank you very much. And uh, may I request Anna Firmalino to join the conversation? Yes, um, good afternoon, everyone. I am Ana Fermalino from the University of the Philippines, Los Baños. So for those in the Philippines, they would know that um, one of our niche areas really is agriculture. And that's why I'm in this session. Um, yeah. I just wanted to respond a little first to the first um, two questions. Um, in terms of support from the government, uh, for those who might not know, our Department of Agriculture does have a program now um, providing loans for young agripreneurs. And so um, that would be one avenue for them to fund projects like um, what you were showing earlier for our students. Um, it's open to those aged 18 to 30. And then um, in terms of, you know, communicating uh, that agriculture is a very significant field. That's why one of the thrusts of UP Los Banos right now is, you know, bringing sexy back. To agriculture so um, that's why we also establish a professional school for agriculture and the environment in our in the southern region of the philippines but i think my main concern really here is that um you're right uh, agriculture isn't that popular especially with our millennials with our younger generation because they don't like getting dirty um, we did a study before uh, with agriculture and um, natural resource related courses. And what we saw was that the students were moving towards um, more of the hybrid programs like agribusiness programs, ag economics programs, ag engineering programs. So not the pure science of agriculture. Although now what we're seeing is that a lot of our students are um, getting interested in horticulture, urban landscaping, edible landscaping. So I think you're right in terms of the communications. We just need to show that, you know, agriculture can be sexy. It can be modern. But I was wondering, in terms of um, your organization, how can, say, you know, smaller groups of students like um, the students that we have, our graduating students who would go into internships or who would be doing thesis topics, that might be related to food security or sustainability. Can they, as smaller groups, um, connect to your organization or does it have to be an institutional arrangement? Because it does help that there's you know, an international flavor <laughs> to these projects. It makes it you know, sexier for them. Thank you very much, Anna Fimalino, for coming live and asking your questions, share your thoughts. But let's see what uh, Peter and Anastasia have to say. Okay, uh, thank you for the question and also for sharing the information. Um, uh, you know, I hear you saying a lot of things that I can uh, agree with. Um, the, indeed, in our campaign, we have also used that language, uh, sort of how can we make agriculture more sexy? Uh, I'm always a bit reluctant because I'm too old to be sexy. But um, frankly, um, the, uh, the point of how can we relate, well, that's why we created this change maker challenge also, because then what we do is we try to connect uh, an, uh, an alumni, so someone from the region who has studied in the Netherlands in this field, to a group of students here. And by, of course, putting in a bit of prize money, and it also makes it more attractive, there's something to win, there's visibility. Um, and that worked really well because we got a lot of interesting proposals and it was really difficult for the jury to determine who could be the prize winner. So we try to create those opportunities. Of course, we cannot, you know, we don't have the capacity to take in every sort of um, uh, uh, individual smaller group. Um, but we are interested uh, to reach out also via our campaign. And of course, this comes out of the relationships of the Netherlands and the Netherlands knowledge sector with Asia. 
uh, but you know we try to be as inclusive as possible it's uh, it's not like uh, we first check your dutch credentials before we work with you it's not that uh, not that dogmatic uh, i hope so uh, we try to be as open as possible also try to put out information that you can use for your students huh? to have an attractive story of an alumna a young woman from vietnam who works in the house which is a seed uh, company uh, and 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 uh, the company produces food for the dairy sector um, that tells her story and and that shows that look you know here i am and i have you know a good career and i have a good life in this sector and those stories that we put on our website we hope can be used widely also to you know for inspiration uh, it's it's uh, it all feeds into changing that changing the sphere around agriculture to make it more sexy. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you Anna. That. Thank you. Thank you. So we still have twenty minutes. So let's make use of that. Oh, you're all speechless about uh, the program, and you're so impressed. So it's. The possibility to inter interact actually directly with our speakers and not hiding yeah. necessarily. So, who would be next? Yes. Okay, please go ahead. Okay, I just would like to ask um, uh, your if you have because you mentioned something, uh, Miss Royce. You said uh, you mentioned something about uh, the. Uh, getting the parents involved and uh, I just would like to know on on how do you do that now and, or well, you have started that already is it evidence-based practice-based or any research that would help that also because because in our case we we started actually the program we are Actually, I'm, I'm, we are into the elementary level, but uh, we are we have this parent education program, and uh, we have started also that uh, urban gardening, and we we're involving the parents. So I just would like to know if you also have, I mean, what what you have so that we can also learn from. So far, we because we just start this campaign, um, we don't really have any. You know, evidence base that we can show you uh, on, you know, what kind of methods that we can use uh, to change the mindset of the parents. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have that yet. But um, this campaign is uh, the Empower Youth for Food campaign is not just dedicated uh, to young people. Of course, that's the main target group. But um, of course, you can you can also uh, uh, involve parents in this, especially for the younger students. Um, but I think that would be uh, something that we could think about because the campaign will run for about a year. So perhaps in the future we can uh, think about, you know, what, what kind of approach that we can use to 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 uh, approach the parents, uh, not just the students but the parents. Uh, but maybe Peter has um, something else to add. Yeah. Well, I I know that uh, you know around uh, we worked with a couple of pilot schools in Indonesia, uh, together with the Indonesian Ministry for Education. Uh, and there, um, as part of uh, improving the stakeholder management, uh, I think there were also sessions uh, with parents uh, of potential students um, to um, educate them indeed, and to provide information about job prospects, about the, so there were representatives from the business sector and so on. Um, the thing is, of course, that often the generation of parents is not yet so internet prone. Uh, depends a bit where you are yeah. in different countries. Um, so often the communication has to be more traditional, let's say. Uh, so I think that has to be accommodated uh, in the approach. Um, and something that, uh, again, it might be a bit different in different Asian countries, uh, because Indonesia is, uh, uh, many people will have a, have, have a mobile phone, uh, but will not use, are not used to look for this kind of information. Uh, the, a parent likes to listen to an expert or a teacher. 
uh, right? Uh, I mean, it's uh, and 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 not look at the video on a mobile phone. Um, so we we have to accommodate that kind of practical aspects, I think, in how we uh, solve this issue. Uh, but we too we do try to look into it. It starts with acknowledging that there is this issue. Uh, because we do a lot of outreach, of course, to students, potential students. Um, and then indeed, very often, uh, you see uh, how important the voice of the parents is. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I see one uh, interesting comment in the chat from Edward Nibalski. Um, he's, I think he's a futurist from the US based in Finland. So. Uh, Edward, can you just share your thought uh, briefly? Uh, yes, uh, good to see you again, Joost. Uh, uh, yeah, I just uh, shared a comment there about um, the role that that I the the, the possibilities that I see in, in a project like this um, in trying to educate youth about the role that agriculture has and can have. Um, I, I feel that it would be, it's a valuable opportunity in programs like this, projects like this to reframe the role of the farmer in, in people's minds. Uh, you know, uh, the traditional idea of the farmer in most settings is kind of the, the, the unsophisticated, uh, you know, rope, holding up his pants uh, kind, kind of individual, right? You know, uh, a, a countryside person, uh, you know, in, in, in most settings. But, uh, you know, we, we tend to forget that these people are experts in what they do, right? These people feed the world, right? They, they have knowledge and expertise, often in, in traditional settings going back hundreds, if not thousands of generations. Uh, and they're the keepers of that knowledge. And if uh, in programs like this, projects like this, the opportunity to reframe how farming and farmers are, acknowledge are acknowledged and how and the role that they have in society can be reframed. So if farmers can be thought of as experts in agriculture, that they truly are. Uh, I think that would le lend for an opportunity to make for an attractive career opportunity for for younger people. Thanks for sharing that, Ed. And you are in the moment in Finland, or where are you? Yeah, I'm. Thank I'm thanks for jo joining in the morning. Great. Um, I mean, that's a, that's a thought. Any any thought from Peter or Anastasia on that? Well, thanks, Edward, for that observation. Um, I'd like to add one element, actually, because that might be interesting for the audience as well. Um, I think, you know, apart from, as you say, redefining uh, the role of the farmer as an expert rather than as somebody who does simple work in a field, um, I think there is also... Uh, progress to be made by benefiting from the fact that certainly the younger generation starts to become more interested in how things are produced. Um, and uh, that starts in the larger urban settings all over Asia. Uh, but I think it would be a mistake to put that away as, oh, that is just a marginal middle class kind of phenomena for the kids who can afford it. I don't think that is true. I don't think that is true. I think that a much broader cross-section of younger people is uh, getting more interested in what they eat, literally. Uh, you see all of a sudden uh, many more people becoming vegetarian or even vegan. And uh, that is just one example of how that then impacts on human behavior. Um, and that is new in Asia uh, uh, because, you know, I've, I've lived and worked in this region for a long time. Uh, I think uh, 25 years ago, nobody had ever heard hardly of, you know, uh, of being a, a vegan. I mean, what was that? 
Um, so, so I think that there is uh, there is also a complementary perspective there to be gained um, to uh, 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 that you can call upon the interest of the younger generation, especially uh, to to where where you say, well, they want to change their behavior at the end of the production chain of food, so that can then positively impact on the more upstream parts of that production chain, starting with the farmer, supported by solid education in this field. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question, Ed. So I just wrote in the chat, this is the last chance if you would like to share a thought or have a question to our colleagues from Nufik, that's your chance. Otherwise I will give Peter and Anastasia maybe the opportunity to say some closing remarks or any any final thoughts or wishes for the future and then we call it a day so i don't see anything coming in so i don't hope that we have exhausted uh, our audience uh, today so then uh, thanks very much peter and anastasia for for sharing on nufix uh, programs and Peter, Anastasia, anything you would like to say at the end of the session? Ladies first. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone, um, for participating in our session. Uh, please join our campaign. Uh, it's always good to uh, have different people collaborate together because we all um, care about this issue. So uh, please uh, join um, our campaign, uh, hashtag Empower Youth for Food. And um, I think my colleague uh, Nanya has put the um, website, the link to the website uh, in the chat box. So thank you. Peter? Okay, from my end too, thank you very much. Thank you very much to the ADB, uh, Joe's to you for helping uh, to facilitate this session. And uh, uh, looking forward to collaborate. And I hope that we have clarified uh, how we look at innovation, that the innovations is are first of all needed in building connections between different stakeholders in this section uh, that will make then the higher education sector more relevant. Uh, it's really about the content that it based on what is needed in the market, what people want to eat. I mean, that's, that, that connection needs to be made much stronger and then we'll build solid and relevant higher education. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, something that uh, became a little bit in the tr tradition in the sessions where I was allocated as a back end moderator, as we call it, I would like to invite everybody for a group picture. So, um, so we took a group picture in every session. So can I request also my ADB colleagues to, to be uh, ready for, for a group picture? And uh, so maybe stop highlighting me and we do a picture of all the participants. So if you are feeling comfortable to, to show yourself in the camera, please do so, so that we have an idea who's there. Feels like there are a few more people joining just for the picture. <laughs> so can, uh, can I, see, I see in the moment only Peter on my screen, maybe I have to change yeah. something. Yes. <laughs> That would yeah. be a very good photo. Yeah. You you mentioned that that you're not feeling so you know what, but uh, maybe <laughs> uh, we might be of the same age, so maybe that's a good say, thing to say. So everybody ready for a group picture? And uh, I see not many people. Okay. Okay, so we'll be. Yeah. Yes, I see Petit. Go ahead, nice see. to see. Yeah, so we'll be taking the photos. So I just have a few people here, three, six, nine, and 11. Anyone else who would like to turn on their videos? Okay, so oh, I'll be taking the, uh, the photo. I'll be taking the screenshot there. Okay, someone's getting it. Okay, so just look directly at the camera and not on the screen. Be taking the photo. Okay, one more. Just let's just have Paul manage his video there. All good, taking the photo now in one, two, three. Just one more again. Look directly at the camera, not on the screen. One, two, three. There it goes. Thanks, everyone. Thanks very much for doing that. So thanks very much for joining. Thanks again, Peter and Anastasia. Have a good day, and I hope to see many of you tomorrow for the final day. Thank you. Have a good afternoon, evening, or night, or whatever time zone you are in. Thank you very much. so global this time. Thank you. Our pleasure. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Yeah.
Mal. So we can stop the recording. And thanks everyone. Thanks very much for your help, Zoe. Thanks everyone Thank for ending this session already. See you all tomorrow. Bye. Bye.